かりますか逆に分かりにくいかもしれないですけど、ツイッターをマスオンにするのは、これ、ディセントライズとかこんな感じで、えー、と徐々にこうなんか支配的なものじゃなくて、えー、と自分たちでもっとあ,あ,りありしきのオープンネットに取り戻そうみたいな話も結構あります。でももしかしたら僕はその話じゃないかもしれないです。今説明したけど、ディ,ディ,ディセントライズウェブっていうのはそういう話じゃないもしかしたらその話じゃないかもしれない。はい、じゃあ、えーと、よろしくお願いします。拍手で。Thank you. So、those are yours. My name is Jim Peck.、Uh, I live in Vancouver, Canada.、And、I've been、uh, working with open source for a long time. I've been very interested in a number of projects.、Um, I was quite, in the 1990s, I was quite active in the Debian project. I started the Debian Arm project, and which、uh, We use things like Raspberry Pi, we're using that many years later.、Uh, if you use、uh, Ubuntu, you use some of my work that I usually put the GNOME packages in the w o r k m a n Back in the 90s, I was very active in the Linux kernel community. I did some very early embedded Linux work, including Sony televisions.、Um, I was very active in the open source Java community before. Uh, Sun Microsystems had access to open source kernel, the real version of Java. There were clones、uh, of Java. And I've been doing open source for a long time.、Um, my career has been a mix of startups and consulting work. So I've worked for five different startups、uh, in California and Canada. And、uh, in, on the consulting side, I have I've worked for many, many clients. I've built many, many websites. I've built several apps.、Um, the startup that everybody seems to know me from is Joyant.、Uh, I worked for Joyant from 2009 to 2011.、Um, so I, that means I worked with Ryan Dahl, who, who created Node.js, and Isaac Schluter,、uh, creator of NPM, and a whole bunch of other、uh, really early Node.js people. The first time I came to Japan, I was working for Joyant. And so I got some pictures from my phone.、Uh, this is the very, very first time I think you know, Jeff's people in Japan got together. We wanted to have some beers.、Um, so the last two years, I'm not working for a startup anymore. I've just been freelancing. And I made a decision to focus on trying to find clients that are doing decentralized web things, which is very difficult. Like, not many companies are doing decentralized web right now.、Um, so, I'll just show some projects I did. So, in the spring,、uh, I worked for a company that nobody has ever heard of called Ink and Switch.、Um, but they, they're interesting. They're the original people who created the Heroku、uh, hosting platform. And they're also collaborating with Martin Kleppman, who wrote this O'Reilly book,、um, Designing Data Intensive Applications. Really a good book by it.、Um, and he works, or he's、um, a professor at the University of Cambridge, and he's working on a piece of software called AutoMerge, which is called a CRDT, or Conflict Free Replicated Data Type. Don't really have to know what that means. Uh, but it just allows you to build applications that are collaborative, a lot like Google Docs.、Uh, the demo that、uh, the project I worked on with them was called Pixel for sure, and it was a pixel art editor.、Um, it was collaborative, multiple people could draw pixel art at the same time,、uh, and underneath the covers, it used the auto merge software. As well as the DAT project. I'll show you DAT in a little bit.、Um, after that,、um, the, the, the main DAT project、uh, with Macintosh, who gave a talk earlier in the day,、um, they decided to hire me、um, to build a demonstration for a new feature they were adding to DAT called、uh, Multi Writer. And、uh, I also.、Um, Added some multi writer support for their command line tool. So if you go to the, the DAT project blog, you can find some of that.、Uh, right now, this is the B jacket,、uh, 
I'm working with Protocol Labs, who are the company behind IPFS. That's another um, decentralized web project that I will show. Um, and I'm work specifically, I'm working in the dynamic data group, which is um, using CRDTs, again, um, with IPFS. And uh, I'm, I'm just last week, I was put in charge of purepad.net, which is a demonstration collaborative text editor. So I'm going to jump into the, uh, I'm going to show you several different projects. So I, I want to start and just set some context. I want to show what people publish things now, and they use sort of centralized technology. Um, so in 1998, uh, you can just make a website. I'm going to show how that works. Uh, but in 2018, uh, we do it differently. Um, and then I'm going to show things that I consider to be decentralized. So I'm going to show WebTorrent, which is sort of like BitTorrent, um, DAC, which I just mentioned, uh, IPFS, well, which I'm working on right now. And uh, yeah, so there's one more. So, okay, so this is my dog. <laughs> We're going to pretend we're in, uh, going back in time, we're 1998. Um, this is actually from the Internet Archive in San Francisco. Uh, they run the Internet Archive uh, way, way back machine where you can look at old websites. Um, so this is the actual picture I took in 1998. This is actually a Japanese website, but it's running in Salt Lake City. I had to fly to Salt Lake City because something broke on the website. <laughs> so, um, and back then, the, the software was really primitive. This became Apache, but you know, I don't know when Apache happened, but it used to be called NCSA HTTP. Um, and to do that, the dog, it's an HTML page. And really, really simple, just put an image on there. Um, and then, nobody FTPs files to say anymore, but you know, I had to like, get that server was in Salt Lake City. I had to like, FTP the files over there. And then uh, load it up in uh, Netscape. Um, this is an actual, real 1998 Netscape. And I made the website, click play, and that was the HTML file. And it actually still works. So, so the problem it, with in the old way was if you're in Japan and the website is in Salt Lake City. So I, do. Uh, I, I did the website, I installed it in Vancouver. And this is right from Yahoo, where we are right now. You see the trace route, and you can see how many milliseconds it takes. So uh, 106 milliseconds, which is pretty fast. It's a tenth of a second when it crosses the ocean. Um, but that's 1998. So now, 2018, uh, I didn't have to change the HTML at all. I was 20 years old. And um, yeah, so what has changed? Um, you, know, you don't put servers in a rack. Somebody does, but you know, you, you just go to Amazon, uh, AWS. Uh, you would put your static assets on the CDN. So, uh, what that means, I'll talk about CDNs. Um, and the web browsers are, they're not Netscape anymore. They are full of, like, oh, there's thousands and thousands of features that have been added to web browsers in, in the past 20 years. Um, and also, um, uh, security, like there's, it, everybody is deploying using uh, SSL certificates, so you can verify. Is. Okay. So CDN, it's probably the biggest thing relevant to what I'm talking about is the content distribution network, or the edge, deploying content at the edge. Um, so here's, this is from Akamai, they just have marketing material, they have computers all over the world that host content. And um, here's another marketing thing where you can see the data is going back and forth between Europe and South America. 
with the CDM, it doesn't have to go to Europe or North America. It can just stay in South America. So, okay, so I deployed that same website on the CDM. And trace route. And this is coming from Yahoo, and you can see um, the number one means it's three milliseconds. So it went from 106 milliseconds to three milliseconds. So almost all the websites you use are deployed on CDNs. So even though a lot of the websites might be American or in Japan, it doesn't really matter because actually the content never goes to North America. So. <laughs> I could click and I just show that that's the To different peers, and you can all have a copy of the, of the data. And you might be downloading it and uploading it at the same time, and then you can immediately start playing the video even as it's still downloading. And uh, it's a really neat technology. Normal BitTorrent doesn't work in the web browser, but this one does uh, because it's using WebRTC. Peers can also talk to other web torrent peer, peers, and they can also talk to hybrid peers. So, normal web torrent client or BitTorrent clients, they can talk web torrent and BitTorrent. Of course, BitTorrent clients can only talk to BitTorrent clients or the hybrid. So, um, next one I'm going to talk about is DAT, DAT data, which I've done a lot of work with this year. Um, so DAT. Um, that was originally a project built for um, uh, sharing science data. So they were funded by a, um, some foundations in the United States that gave them a million and a half dollars to hire team developers and build this tool. Um, it's sort of similar to BitTorrent, uh, except it's sort of like BitTorrent version 2. And uh, Matthias Boos, or Mathintosh, who gave a talk earlier today, he wrote most of that. Um, the biggest difference between BitTorrent and, and DAT, I would say, is the ability to, when you use BitTorrent, you're usually putting one file in there and it breaks into a bunch of pieces, but you can't change the file once you made the BitTorrent file. With DAT, it's a folder of files, so you can put in new files and change files, and it'll issue new versions, and it'll sync across the network just like BitTorrent. So, I'm going to use the example of a science, scientific thing. I'm not going to read this. This is, this is really hard to read. Um, but this is actually a title um, of a paper that was published by um, Daniel Robinson, who's actually one of the two people that are in charge of the DAP project. So she's a neuros neuroscience, neuroscientist. And they, they take um, brain cells and use microscopes and study various diseases and they collaborate with other scientists and <coughs> they need technology to allow them to transfer big files back and forth and share scientific data. 
So I'm going to show a little video here with uh, demonstrating Beaker Browser, which was talked about earlier today. And so this is how scientists might share data. They would have their files on the on disk. They would do neuroscience data. Give us some Beaker Browser. Give it a title. You can see they have microscope data here and maybe raw data. I, I just made up this data, but it's not real. And uh, okay. so you can just do it in, right in the web browser. Um, but what what happens when it shares it is it's a lot like BitTorrent. So. These would be different. So that would be like the first scientist. This would be another scientist. And it could be in a different university. They don't need to talk to their university IT department to set this up. They can just do it. And then that might be another collaborator. Um, and as more and more people join, they'll get the data. And then everybody will have a copy of the data. Um, so, so the, the scientists can just work work with each other and share huge amounts of data, um, and they can just do it. Like they don't have to sign up for Dropbox accounts or get their university IT department to agree to set up these things. Um, but. Universities are supporting this work, so the DAT project is actually working with the California Digital Library and the uh, Internet Archive, and the University of California system is a whole bunch of universities, for example, like Berkeley and UCLA, and they are going to use DAT to actually use it with real science data, and the libraries will set up servers which will multiple universities which will keep copies of this data alive forever. So the next project in the work to talk about is IPFS. Um, so IPFS um, is very similar to that, um, but it does one main thing differently, and it's called content addressability. So when you put a file into IPFS, it creates a, ha uh, a cryptographic hash of the file, which is just a short number or a, a string, um, which will always be the same as long as all the bytes in the file are the same. If you change one byte, that number will change. So by having these long numbers, you can put the file, you put the file in the IPFS, and it'll give you the number back. Somebody else can put the same file into their IPFS, and they'll get the same you don't have the file, you can just put, ask for that number, and it will find somewhere in the world, if you can find it, uh, and give you the file. Okay, um, the nice thing about this is the deduplication. So, um, with that, if you had put the same file into multiple DAT archives, you can store it multiple times on your disk. With IPFS, only one copy. Um, built by Protocol Labs. I'm working for them right now. Um, so I made a, a little demo to try to explain the deduplication. Um, so the, the, the scenario here is there's two different art galleries, and I just made up fake ones. Um, I didn't have time to find the real art, so I just used some of my own photos. So, so this is a uh, Chrome, this, is, this, this user is going to access one art gallery. It's going to be the uh, Vancouver Art Gallery. This is not the real Vancouver Art Gallery. But this is really Vancouver. I took this picture. And it's using this uh, framework um, called uh, IIIF, which a lot of art galleries use. It allows you to zoom in on there. So this, these files are really, really, really big. Um, so. Imagine this is coming from Vancouver Art Gallery. Now say there's an art gallery in Tokyo, and this is a different user, and they might be somewhere else, and uh, they're using Firefox. And this is this is Firefox, but it's also using this uh, uh, IPFS plugin 
this uh, add-on that's added into extension in Firefox, which means it will actually load it straight off the IPFS network. The, the first time it wasn't. So, it looks the same, but you'll see I said Art Gallery in Tokyo. But it's a different server. And then I can look in the, there's a uh, tool in the Firefox extension which lets you see some, see some of the kind of speed dials and and do the same thing. And then, so this is loading it straight off the IPFS network. The first time it's loading it through an HTTP gateway. So then you can see the little graph is changing. Now, what would ha what would happen is, even though they're different art galleries, and the two people loaded them in different browsers, because it was the same image, was at both art galleries. Um, they would sort of participate in the same swarm, so they would uh, be able to share data and be duplicate. Um, so even if like, uh, it would, it could even share between the different web browsers themselves, pure to pure style. So the last one I want to talk about is uh, Secure Scuttlebutt, and this will be really short. Um, and it's, uh, it's a, another peer-to-peer -peer system, but it's designed around social networking, sort of like Facebook. Um, but there's no servers. Um, every person has an append-only feed, it's sort of like a blog or Twitter and it status updates. And it works offline, so if um, somebody has a secure scuttlebot on their laptop, and they also have a secure scuttlebot on their phone, even if they're not connected to the internet, um, they should be able to, um, the, the, the status updates will transfer over the local network between their devices. So it's possible to use a secure scuttlebutt even in disaster scenarios, like an earthquake or something where the internet is operating. So, and, but it also works with the internet, so people can set up peers that their whole purpose is to transfer messages around. Secure style. <coughs> so the main client that people use with uh, Secure Style Lab is Patchwork. It's an Electron app, um, but it's just very similar to most other um, social network type things you use. You have friends, you make friends, uh, you post updates. But the, the, what's different is there's no server involved, and um, no centralized server, and so the updates just sort of propagate around. Um, and there's also, just recently, um, there is a new Android uh, one, so you can actually use it on your phone as well. So, um, so still early days for decentralized web. I would recommend, just if you have time, uh, try one of those four pro projects I talked, uh, talked about. Um, and uh, things like Secure Scala are really, really easy to get started with. Um, things like IPFS are a little bit more fancy. A secure browser is really easy to get started with. So. ピアツーピア事例というかそのあれですねアプリケーションだったりとかツールだったりとかを紹介してくれるっていう話でしたすごく面白かったですね意外と僕の最初に話してもらった話っぽい感じですねはいじゃあえっ、ー、とですね26分なんですけどまあえっ、ー、と今から